Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that short break and got some refreshments. We move on to our final session on our health, advances in cancer, diagnosis, monitoring, and management, a panel discussion that will be moderated by Dr. Delroy Jefferson, who's the medical director for the Cayman Islands Health Services Authority, and he'll be joined on the panel by Dr. Lundy Richards, Dr. Courtney Cummings, Dr. Dali Solomon, Dr. Vinita Binoy. We're excited to have such an esteemed panel and we look forward to the discussions. I will now hand over to Dr. Jefferson. Thank you, Mr. Masters of Ceremony. So we've come to the penultimate presentation for the day. We've had a very impactful conference, and I'm sure you can all agree that we've learned quite a lot. Now, we have with us an esteemed panel who will be discussing something that is very dear to us. I mean, as, as you listen to the conference over the past um, three days, this is the third day, you recognize that there is a, a, a common thread that cancers are very important to the population within the Cayman Islands. The various presentations have drawn our attention to that important disorder. The planning committee recognized that there was a need for us to look a little bit more closely at cancer. The committee wanted to draw attention to two important issues. The first issue is that as a country, we are fortunate in having a very good team of experts drawn from the three facilities, three major facilities. And represented on the panel are members from the Cayman Islands Health Services Authority, Health City Cayman, and Doctor's Hospital. The significance of this is that we now are able to collaboratively address several cancer-related issues that in times past we were not able to address. The second issue is that there are advances made in cancer. And the committee, the panel, will be looking at some of these advances and will be affording you the opportunity to ask questions. So let me now introduce the panel members. Dr. Courtney Cummings, he is a consultant physician at the Health Services Authority. He has a doctorate in internal medicine and he currently serves as the Deputy Medical Director at the Cayman Islands Health Services Authority. He was a former acting medical director for the HSA, and he now chairs the Stroke Protocol Committee. The CME is a CME coordinator and a member of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee. He also is a member of the Clinical Practice Review Committee, and he also is one of the key persons on the national and the HSA COVID task force. Then we have Dr. Venita Binoy. Venita practices as a consultant medical oncologist at Health City, Cayman Islands. She's trained in internal medicine and medical oncology and hematology, and she's also trained in hemopoietic stem cell transplantation at various prestigious institutes in India and Australia. She has over 15 years of experience in oncology, and as a firm believer of comprehensive cancer care, her focus is on the prevention, screening, early detection, diagnosis, and multidisciplinary management of hematological and non-hematological malignancies. Then sitting um, next to Dr. Cummings, we have Dr. Lunda Riches, who you've heard from 
yesterday. Dr. Richards is a consultant medical hematologist oncologist at the Health Services Authority and has been part of the organization's internal medicine, pathology lab, and hematology oncology team since, 19, nine, since 2019. Prior to joining the HSA, he was a visiting specialist to oncology patients on Ireland. In addition to hematology and oncology services, he provides expertise in public health, blood bank, and transfusion medicine. Last but not least is Dr. Darley Solomon. Dr. Solomon is an attending general surgeon at Doctors Hospital, Doctors Hospital specializing in treating patients with abdominal pain, hernias, gallbladder, colon, and breast complications. Dr. Solomon obtained his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at Harvard University in Washington, DC, where he also received his DL is MD. Dr. Solomon has practiced as an attending and consultant surgeon in both Mississippi and the Cayman Islands. He's a member of the Mississippi State Medical Association, the American Medical Association, and the American Society of General Surgery. I've given you a snippet of the caliber of persons on Ireland who are available to collaboratively provide care in cancer treatment. Please put your hands together in welcoming the panel. I'll say a brief note on how this panel discussion will proceed. Um, initially, we'll have Dr. Cummings giving a general overview, and then each panel member will spend a few minutes highlighting specific aspects of cancer, at the end of which we are anticipating that the audience will be providing questions to the panelists. So without further ado, could Dr. Cummings come to the podium, please? Thank you, Dr. Jeff, and a very pleasant good morning to you all. I want to add my voice to that of um, speakers before me in congratulating the organizers of this conference and for inviting me also to come along. As Dr. Jeff said, I will be given an overview of cancer, albeit a very brief overview, and so I want to start by agreeing with you what the diagnosis of cancer is. It's a disease of uncontrolled abnormal division of cells. And those cells have a potential to spread to other areas. We agree, and thank you for agreeing with me. In order to make the points that I'd like to make quickly in the time that is mine to share, a very brief time, they told me, um, I want to talk to us about the basic stru uh, structure of the atom, a bit of physics, if you mind, if you don't mind. The basic structure or the basic relevant structure of the cell and then I want to talk about cellular division. And then I want to talk after that about tumor markers. And if time permits me, briefly, we'll talk about the modalities of cancer investigation and treatment. If you will, look at me, please. At, on the left-hand side of that slide, you'll see that's the pictorial representation of an atom. An atom is the smallest uh, particle in terms of matter, the smallest. And it has at its central part, there's the, the nucleus, which consists of the, as you can see there, the protons, which are positively charged particles, and the neutrons, which have no charge. Orbiting around that 
nucleus are what we call electrons, and they are, they are negatively charged. And so you will see that the electrons and the protons, they are equal in number. So one has positive charge and the other has negative. So the whole atom is stable because they, not, they, they, they neutralize each other in terms of charge, electrical charge. But the electron that is there orbits the neutron just as the planets orbit the sun. And they do that very fast. How fast? I'm glad you asked me. Somewhere I read, somewhere I read that they move at the speed of 2,200 kilometers per second, Dr. Jeff. That means it takes, it would take about 18 seconds to go around the Earth. We're still in physics, don't worry. We get off of physics just now. And it's so fast that we can't see it. All you see is a cloud of a cloud going around the the, neutron, the the nucleus. That's all you see. Whereas you can see other things, you can't see the electron. So they're full of energy. And I want to say to you that the electrons, they, as that slide shows, they are. Hold on. Where are you going? <laughs> right. It shows there, there are different orbits. And the point I want to make here is that there, these different orbits have different energy status. Hold on. The, the electrons, those electrons, they hang out in pairs only, or they like to hang out in pairs. So one of the points I want to make right now is that when in any of the orbits, orbit one or two or three, this is just a pictorial representation. If there's an uneven number or on parallel um, electron, that electron is unstable, and it tries to capture another electron from somewhere else, or it tries to give up its electron to somewhere else to become stable. Hence, with that, what they do, these atoms, they join up with each other. Another atom here, and another one here, and before you know it, you have two or three or many atoms forming a molecule. And that molecule joined together by different bonds, covalent, hydrogen bond, ionic bond, whatever it is. They join together and form one large molecule, which could be protein, lipids, whatever it is. And it's that collection of molecules that will form a cell. And you see what I have it here. So the atom, the, many of them, in fact, a cell consists, and it's here, of trillions of atoms. So many atoms combine to form the constituents of a cell. And so the atoms form molecules, which then eventually form cells, and then eventually form an organism. You understand that? So the cell. I want to show you that the cell, and the important part of this that I want to tell you about is just the nucleus of the cell, but bear with me. The cell has the organelles, the ribosomes, the mitochondria, and they all comprise atoms. Atoms make them all up. We, that's basic, we understand that, we agree on that. But we want to talk about the nucleus of the cell. That nucleus contains the chromosomes, and if you were to, you know that there's um, 23 pairs of chromosomes in adults, in, in humans, and if you were to take the chromosomes and strip them out, you'll find the DNA. The DNA is nothing more than a long, miles long length of atoms and atoms and atoms and atoms. And every quarter mile, I'm just using that term, is a gene. So you've got a gene for hair color, gene for skin color, gene for height, etc., etc. So in other words, packed in this nucleus, you have everything that determines how you look. 
um, all the things that you got from your mother, and unfortunately from your father also too. <laughs> but this slide tells you more or less what I just said. Right. And so one of the points I wanted to make here before I get onto this slide is if you noticed, you just go back to that, that the nucleus contained that DNA, the chromosomes, that determines everything. But the chromosomes, the DNA, is made up of atoms. You remember that? And the atoms, they join together. Um, and what I want to say here now is that the cells of human body, all our cells, are continually bombarded by things that can damage the DNA. What things are that you ask? Well, let me tell you since you asked me. The things are ionizing radiation, general, chemicals, drugs, viruses. The bottom line is all of these things, what they do, they tend to affect the atom and thereby affect the molecules, because remember that atoms are joined together. And what I should tell you quickly is that, so you have an atom, and we said that when the electrons, um, if, the, if the electrons are not paired, it becomes um, what I call unstable. So an unpaired electron will look for another electron. And what these things do, ionizing radiation and some of the other things that I mentioned, they will move electrons from off the atom. No, you understand? So exposing someone to, um, to ionizing radiation, all you're doing is moving electrons and you're making these atoms that are in molecules very unstable. Not only that, the unstable molecule that remains there, or atom, becomes like a, what we call a free radical, reactive oxygen species, not to confuse you. In other words, it starts to look for somewhere else that it can attach to. So when you move that electron from that atom, that's the just, we can pack our bags and go home right now. That's the electron. When you move that, that electron from off that, that atom, it looks for other places to go, and it pulls off of the DNA. It pulls off of the, the, the lipids, pulls off everything. But importantly, it's the DNA that is damages. And that DNA, when that DNA is damaged, then other things happen. I want to quickly say also, uh, the problem with radiation, it not only damages the DNA, there's something we have that is called the DNA repair genes. It always stops and it blocks that also. We're going to see that in more detail. So come with me. Let me show you, first of all, that um, cellular division, which we want to talk about, simply is that um, cells, uh, um, there's a mother cell. There's a mother cell here. You can see that mother cell here. And the mother cell replicates the DNA. So there's equal amount of um, this, 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 this is supposed to be 40, um, uh, uh, 23 pairs. You can see that, right? I can see that. Just say yes. You can see it. 23 pairs. Even though it's one. But it's duplicated. So you get exactly um, a duplicate of this. So you got four now. So two, no, four. So two on each. And eventually that cells divide, and there are two daughter cells that contain exactly the same genetic component as the mother cell. We're doing that. And so I learned from my, my, um, my um, Sunday school teacher that division is really multiplication. You see there? <laughs> and so I want to show it on another, I know my time is, am I, yeah. This other slide, very important, you get this. So this is exactly what I just said there. But I want to use a term which is going to be important for you to understand this lecture and what my good people behind me will say. So 
this is the same cellular division where the mother cell divides into two daughter cells. And here you have what it is, is that cell, um, if the cell were in the resting phase, you call it the G0 phase, but it's in the G1 phase because some cells don't divide like the brain cells and the muscle cells. We're not talking about that. We don't want to talk about that today. But the G1 phase, what happens, this cell, let's say it's an epithelial cell, uh, epithelial cell from the intestine, instruction is given for it to divide. So what happens, the, the proto-oncogenes, this gene here, this gene, sends a signal so that it pushes the cell from the G1 phase to the S phase. So it pushes on, because the full cycle is G1, S, G2, then M. And then, this is normal cell division we're talking about, and you got the tumor suppression genes, they do something else. They now, they usually inhibit the, um, the transition to the S phase. So when that cell gets the signal to divide or to multiply if you want, what it does, this is activated, this is activated, and this is blocked. So the cell can divide properly. Okay? Got that? So the next slide will show you this now. So that's normal. That's normal. I want to show you this quickly. And um, in cancer now, what happens? In cancer, the proto-oncogenes are permanently turned on right? Um, they're turned on. And so the cell is moving from the G1 phase to the S phase. It's, it's going on with division, right? And the suppressor genes, the tumor suppressor genes, are turned off. Nothing blocks it. So now you understand there's a constant production of cells with no limitation. This is why I started and I said it's uncontrolled division of cells. My first slide said that. But there's another thing I want you to take note of here, the DNA repair gene malfunctions. Um, that gene should, when it sees abnormal breaks in the DNA, should shut it down. That is what a gene, once it recognizes something abnormal, it should say, shut down. But that is malfunctioning too also. So these three things happen and produce cancer. And so I agree with Dr. Richards who said yesterday, and, doctor, and um, I almost call him Dr. Um, Jonathan. Um, Jonathan. But that's a, that's a prophecy too. I'm giving prophecy here too, by the way. <laughs> um, that tells you it's a genetic disease. So um, cancer is a genetic disease. This slide shows you exactly what I said before. It's in a beautiful way. In cancer, the oncogenes, you see what I said? They're permanently turned on. They're pushing the cells to divide and the tumor suppression genes are permanently turned off. There's nothing blocking it. So guess what? There's a production of cells that are abnormal now. And if I had time, and I don't have time, I would have told you that um, the cells clearly in the cancer cells, because the, the, the genetic, the DNA has been altered, the radiation has damaged the DNA, so it's a different type of cell being produced. So you're getting excessive production of these abnormal cells for the reasons I mentioned. And so this slide um, says exactly what um, the good folks said yesterday. It shows now the tumor markers. And we have a whole host, and I know Dr. Richards said it at nauseam even through this yesterday. And not only the, 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 the list of tumor markers, you can see them here, tumor markers, but also the approved therapy. And that's the benefit of the genetic testing, which my colleagues will probably talk about in specific cases. But now we know we can, we can actually um, document the tumor markers in individual cancers. And because you can do that now, we can target them, the so-called targeted therapy. And so this slide, again, says more or less what I said just now. But I want to take you, I want to bring your attention to one point down here, this one here. This targeted therapy 
is the basis for immunotherapy and cancer vaccines, such as um, the, the HPC, HPV vaccine that we, we give um, to patients. And it's because of targeting and finding out um, what, the, um, what the, the, the tumor marker is, you can then predict now what treatment to use. So I'm going to quickly say, get out of here, Dr. Jeff. I can see your, I, I give it, I see an evil eye. I see the evil eye. I see it. <laughs> so, so the, this slide simply tells you, based on all the things we said, and my colleagues will go into some more detail, um, the things we can do um, um, to investigate the patients and all the treatments. Dr. Um, Richards and Jonathan went through in detail. I could have taken this slide out. Um, all these things yesterday, they went through monoclonal antibodies, etc. cetera. Um, radiation therapy, I'm gonna end here now. Um, radiation therapy, so it's the same principle. So when you give the pa so a patient has a cancer, and you, um, and uh, what happens is that the, the treatment is so good now. First of all, we can give a, like a pencil point. We can pinpoint a tumor and just go straight for that tumor. Now, prior to this time, Prior to this era, when we give patients radiotherapy, we would give them radiotherapy and we damage other things. We damage the bowel, we damage the skin. No, we're different now. What we do, we give exactly to the location, as I said, pencil point. And they give that treatment. And why is it effective? Because what are you doing? You're actually, the cancer cells that are, are proliferating now, you hit the electrons off of the the atom for the cancer cell, and guess what? It destroys it. And that's really what it is. So, so it's not only that this, this radi ionizing radiation is bad for good cells, it's bad for bad cells also. And I think, I think I'm going to stop here, um, and thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Good afternoon, all. I'm nearly there. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, the Ministry of Health and Wellness and the Health Services Authority for giving me this opportunity to take part in this panel discussion. Dr. Cummins has uh, made the job of the rest of our panelists easier by his detailed overview. It's an overview, but it's very detailed, and it makes our job easier because these are the very things that we are going to touch upon in our panel discussion today. So um, I'll be discussing some new concepts and strategies focusing on breast and lung cancers. And on top of that list is what we call precision medicine. And for those of you who attended Dr. Richard's talk yesterday and also um, uh, Mr. Smelly's uh, talk, we, have, we all know now that cancer is genetic in origin. And we talked in detail about the genomics of cancer yesterday. And just like every single individual in this hall has a ge different genetic makeup, everybody is unique, all cancers have different genetic makeup, we now know that. So we cannot treat all cancers the same, and it's important to know the molecular signatures um, of each cancer before we decide on the best treatment. And this is what we call a personalized cancer medicine, which is, you know, every person needs to have his own treatment plan and you cannot treat everybody the same. So that is precision medicine for you. I'll be coming to that a little bit uh, um, in detail. Then the next one we have is one of the, the greatest breakthroughs of this decade is cancer immunotherapy. So we know that we have an immune system that fights and protects our body against viral infections, bacterial infections, and so forth, but a part of the immune system also takes part in cancer surveillance and destruction of cancer cells. And most of the time when we have a cancer in the body, it's because that part of the immune system is weakened or the cancer overrides that immune system. And now we have several immunotherapy molecules, which could be antibodies, uh, which could be uh, you know, what you call CAR T cell therapy, which is specifically engineered T cells. It could be cancer vaccines. When, uh, and they have, 
led to you know outstanding uh, you know improvements in survival in many cancers advanced cancers of the lung melanoma kidney cancers and all to give you an example the first cancer immunotherapy in cayman was uh, an elderly gentleman with stage 4 lung cancer this was 2016 a diagnosis he had a um, malignant pleural effusion that is fluid in the lungs he had extensive liver metastasis. The liver was riddled with tumor, extensive bone metastasis. So the standard of treatment that time was chemotherapy. And as all my oncology colleagues know, for lung cancer, chemotherapy is very difficult. Survival rates are only six to nine months. Most people do not tolerate chemotherapy very well. And this gentleman was going the same way. And he was not responding to chemo. He was doing very well. He had very, very badly affected by toxicities like neuropathy, anemia. And it was then that the approval for the first immunotherapy came. Luckily, we were able to procure that drug. We got insurance approval, and I gave him the first infusion. No guarantees. The family was prepared for palliative care. And then I went on a vacation for three weeks. Um, after his first infusion, I didn't hope to find him alive when I came back. I was expecting bad news. When I came back, I was surprised to see he was still alive, looking better, feeling better. And to my surprise and everybody's happiness, after three more cycles of immunotherapy, all his cancer was gone, literally. The liver was clean. I, I think I've shown this PET scan many times in previous presentations. His PET scan was clear. No metastasis, nothing. And this was, you know, such a, uh, we were like so happy with the outcomes. And since then, there have been, you know, both all hospitals in Cayman, we've been treating patients with immunotherapy on a regular basis, sometimes with fantastic results. I've had at least two patients with stage four lung cancers, one with tumors in the brain, who has gone into complete remission, what you call, uh, just with immunotherapy. And the remission has been maintained, the response rates maintained for two years. I have been able to take them off immunotherapy. So stage four cancers, lung cancers cured, melanomas cured, or in remission at least. You know, we, when we reach a survival of two years in remission, complete response, we might gingerly call them cured, even though we are keeping them under follow-up. So these kind of outstanding results are now we see with immunotherapy, mind you, not all cancers, not all patients, but some of them for whom it works, it works really well. We also have at least four uh, or more than that, and at least in my experience, uh, patients with refractory blood cancers who have received what we call CAR T cell therapy in the States, and they are in remission. So these are very difficult to treat refractory blood cancers, but they have gone overseas, got CAR T cell therapy, and they have gone into remission. So this is uh, cancer immunotherapy, and now we know that, um, according to data from the United States, at least 40% of cancer benefit patients could derive a benefit from immunotherapy. And almost 60 to 70% of cancer patients derive a benefit from targeted therapy. So that's where we are headed. So we also talk about uh, a new strategy, which is risk-adapted screening and treatment of patients. So we do not treat every patient the same. For some patients, some tumors, based, we assess their risk. What is their risk of the cancer coming back? Is it very high risk? Then we do more. Low risk, we do less. So sometimes less is more for uh, patients. For example, breast cancer patients with very high expression of estrogen receptors, we do what is called a molecular signature testing, and that can tell us whether the patient will benefit from chemo or not. And a lot of the time we find that, okay, the, the, the test tells us that this patient will not benefit from chemotherapy, instead give only hormone therapy. So we are saving the patient from the, you know, uh, from the toxicities of chemotherapy. And sometimes some patients with very high risk disease, it could be cancer genetics or own genetics will need more. For example, somebody with a BRCA gene mutation, they're at a very high risk of developing secondary cancers, bilateral breast cancers. Sometimes if the patient has a breast cancer, it is better to remove both breasts to reduce what we call a bilateral risk reduction mastectomy to reduce their risk of a cancer in the other breast. So looking at a patient's risk factors, individual characteristics, it could be the tumor characteristics or the patient's own characteristics, 
we are able to adapt the treatment to their risk. And of course, we have new combinations of existing treatments. We must remember that one of the pillars, that is chemotherapy, radiotherapy, they have not gone anywhere. They will still be around, but we are finding fantastic responses and improved outcomes, survivals, uh, lower recurrence rates when we compare the standard chemo to immunotherapy and various targeted therapies. So you're looking at new combinations of existing treatments. We also look at new drug types. For example, the antibody drug conjugates, or ADC. We all, probably all of us have heard about the drug called Herceptin, which is used in breast cancer. It is a targeted therapy, an antibody, which uh, binds to the HER2 receptor on breast cancer cells. And those, it has a, it's a revolutionary drug, actually, which has saved the lives of, I would say, thousands or millions of breast cancer patients. What we have found that this drug could be, you know, you could add a chemotherapy molecule to it. It's like a piggyback. So the drug goes the, and binds to the HER2, the Herceptin part of it binds to the HER2 receptor, and then there is a payload of a chemo drug, which kills the cancer cell. So the additional benefit, the, the drug goes only to the cells which have HER2, it delivers the chemo directly, and enhances cell killing. And what we are finding is that this drug has been, you know, uh, much more effective in, in treating advanced breast cancers than after progression on Herceptin. We also talk about repurposing drugs for oncology. So we have, I said, some drugs which are approved in certain cancer types. We have been using them more and more for other cancers. One example is that uh, is Herceptin. It started off as a breast cancer drug, but later on we found that gastric cancers, colon cancers, can all have HER2 receptors. Now the latest one on that list is lung cancer. So even lung cancers can express HER2 receptors. So we use, we try Herceptin for these cancers too, and they work. For those who have the HER2 overexpression, they work. And the entire basis of repurposing is that we already know the drug, we already know its side effects, so it doesn't take much long for approval, it doesn't, it's not so expensive, and it works. So, and we also have other non-cancer drugs which can help in addition to the treatments, for example, the drug metformin, which is very commonly used, we know diabetes, Metformin has been found to target some receptors called mTOR receptors and cancer cells. So studies are underway where we can use some of the cheaper drugs as adjuncts in cancer treatment. And we also have broadly, you know, we tend to treat as a part of personalized medicine, we want to treat the patient as a whole. And we cannot forget the concept of integrative oncology where we bring a whole lot of supportive services including palliative pain and palliative care to the management of cancer patients. So these are, integrative oncology is a very, uh, you know, evolving and well-accepted um, strategy in treatment of cancer. So I just wanted to uh, focus a bit on liquid biopsies. So Dr. Richards spoke extensively on liquid biopsies yesterday for those who are not here. It uses a blood sample. It can also use a liquid biopsy because we are using the blood. It's a very easy way of getting hold of some tumor cells. So it usually works in advanced cancers very well because they have a lot of circulating tumor cells. But even patients who have early cancers could have some tumor cells circulating in the blood. And we extract them or the DNA from the blood sample and we run a whole lot of gene testing, a panel testing on it, identifying all these different, what we call the mutations um, in the cancer cell. And we can use this from early diagnosis to the treatment. So now several tests, you know, the holy grail of cancer screening is a test that could pick up cancer, a blood test. Everybody asks me all the time, do you have a blood test instead of all the mammograms and the scans? When will we get a blood test that could tell us whether you have cancer or not? Well, it's not yet there, we are not yet there, but something might be in the horizon and a lot of um, research going on, but you could just take a blood sample, run the test, and it could possibly tell you, you have a 40% chance that you have a pancreatic cancer, get yourself tested, maybe go and have that MRI. And when you have early cancer, you finish, for example, a breast cancer, you, or blood cancer, it is used commonly in blood cancer. When somebody is in remission, the bone marrow is clear, you do a liquid biopsy, it can run some tests and say, okay, do you still have a little bit of cancer cells left that you cannot see on the bone marrow under the microscope? Then we intensify the treatment. 
And of course, as I said, for cancers who are which are metastatic, advanced, and refractory, finding new and new molecular markers will help us. For example, a patient of mine who is a young, young, relatively young person presented with extensive metastasis in almost all organs in the body. Full of the bones are full of metastatic disease, the lungs, he had deposits in the skin, in the muscle, in the brain. And usually a pathologist tells me where the primary cancer is from, or the radiologist. Okay, there is a tumor in the lung that is prominent. This is a primary cancer. This gentleman we couldn't say because the lung nodules are very small. They didn't look like primary lung. And everywhere we couldn't find a primary, and there was the pathologist told us it could be from the gastrointestinal tract because it was a mucinous type. So usually a pathologist is our best friend, but with liquid biopsies, I now consider a molecular biologist my best friend. So Jonathan is here, but my pathologist Jyoti is not here, thank God. She won't give me her next biopsy. <laughs> so, and we ran the test, foundation one liquid biopsy, and it came back showing a mutation or a marker that told me, told me this is a lung cancer. So you have to treat it as a lung cancer because the primary is lung, which the pathologist could not tell me even the comprehensive testing. And then, so the liquid biopsy is, is a standard practice now, but we do have a lot of issues because we have to explain to patients what it is all about. Just the other day, one of my elderly ladies, I mean, I wanted to share get lung cancer, want to run marker testing liquid biopsy, explain everything to her. She probably didn't understand. She got the consent form. She said, you are making me a guinea pig. What is this? What are you going to do with my blood? So it says the blood will go into a tissue repository. She didn't understand what it meant. So she was all up in arms against me, but I had to spend an hour to tell her what it was all about. Now, uh, where we stand right now in cancer care, we have the traditional pillars of surgery. Obviously, a surgeon is our best friend. Radiotherapy, the traditional cancer chemotherapy, and we also have precision therapy or targeted therapy, and we have immunotherapy. So just two brief uh, snippets of two cases, uh, one breast cancer and lung cancer. So these are the two commonest cancers um, all around the world and also in Cayman. Um, I know the data didn't mention lung cancer at all, but from our experience, Dr. Richards will agree that lung cancer also tops the commonest cancer, especially in men, uh, maybe after prostate. So this is a 35-year-old lady, a very young lady. She, had a, uh, she found a lump in her left breast. And then after mammography and ultrasound, they found a tumor a biopsy. They found that the cancer is in the breast as well as lymph nodes. It is a triple negative type. That means it's estrogen receptor negative, progesterone negative, HER2 negative. So all three standard markers are negative. We know the triple negative cancer is one of the most aggressive kind of breast cancer, very high growth rate and spreads fast. About 20, 25 years ago, we didn't even know that something called a triple negative cancer existed. We didn't know that terminology at all. We thought all breast cancers are the same. So at 20 uh, years ago, we would have stage two cancer. The surgeon would have come in and operated on her, removed the breast, she would have got chemotherapy, which is quite standard, and maybe some radiation. But uh, now we know it's not like that. We, we need to ask her more things. So when we went to the family history, she had uh, an aunt who had breast cancer at a very young age too, and she's triple negative. She is young. We need to do what we call a BRCA testing. So BRCA gene mutations, everybody elaborated before. It's a DNA repair gene. When if there is a mutation, people develop cancers. This is a patient with standard treatment. We would not run or rush into surgery now. Given that she had cancer in the lymph nodes, we'll give her chemo and immunotherapy first. Following surgery, she also needs adjuvant immunotherapy. And of course, if she had a BRCA mutation instead of immunotherapy, we'll give her what is called PARP inhibitors. So we can comparing what it was two days, decades ago, just surgery, blanket, chemo, and then maybe some radiation, and leave her to her fate, exactly what we are doing. And more than 50% of these patients used to have recurrences and metastatic spread. But with this, you know, this is how we personalize her treatment. And second case, a 74-year-old lady, never smoked in her life, and now diagnosed with lung cancer, uh, metastatic, with pleural effusion, and she also has bone metastasis. And now, 
as I mentioned about 10 years ago, we would have just given her chemotherapy, the standard chemotherapy. Being 74 year old, she would have never tolerated it more than three months of, she would have died in six months, she would pass away. But this time we did biomarker testing, both on the tissue, the biopsy, as well as a liquid. We found that she has what you call an EGFR mutation. And in my tumor board, my colleagues often make fun of me because it's always A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z mutation. And now they know all about it because I've trained them well enough. So my, our uh, chief of anesthesia always says, whenever I talk about liquid biopsy, is there EGFR mutation? That's the only thing he knows. So one of the commonest mutations in this age group, non-smoker, and this makes her eligible for a targeted therapy, which is a pill called, uh, you know, we use Tagri, so there are several pills available. People with advanced cancers like this could live three or eight, four or even five years um, on that pill. So, yeah, so she received the targeted therapy and still doing well. So as far as, you know, we are concerned about cancer treatment, the one size fits all store on sale, it's going to close down. But I would never recommend you going there and buying something on discount, please not. So let everything expire, we are not going that way anymore. So it's, that's um, what we are looking at in the future. The cancer moonshot hopefully uh, will become something true in the near future. Thank you. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from Dr. Cummings, you've heard the fact that he explained the, up to the microscopic level what's going on within the cancer cells. And you've heard from Dr. Binoy that we've moved away from the former dispensation with respect to the management and tr the treatment of cancers to know there are much more modern um, techniques. I'm gonna be turning the attention to the panelists, and um, I am gonna be stimulating the discussion by asking a few questions of Dr. Darley Solomon and Dr. Lundy, and then um, I'll allow you the opportunity to ask questions as well. My first question is to Dr. Darley Solomon. We've had a number of, um, we've heard, for example, that we've moved away from the era where everything was, you debulk, you big massive surgeries to remove the cancers. And now we're moving away to what's called minimal invasive cancer. Dr. Solomon, in your opinion, um, what could you say about the new technologies with respect to the minimal invasive cancers, the minimal invasive treatment of cancers? Well, first of all, thank you all for, uh, for being here. This is uh, an important topic, uh, especially here in the Cayman Islands. Uh, there's a lot of progress from a surgical point of view. We are, believe it or not, even from my point of view, we are doing less aggressive surgery. And that is a good thing because with surgery comes comorbidity or uh, injuries. For example, uh, when they were doing radical mastectomies, it was quite common to have women with lymphedema of the arm, which can be debilitating, uh, wing scapulas, so they lose motion of their uh, uh, shoulders. And in 73, they 73, that's how long breast conservation surgery has been recommended as a standard of care. And so along the way, we, I think it was 99, uh, we started saying that, well, you may not need to do axillary node dissections. Maybe you could do sentinel node uh, dissections. So that was 1999. And now it's progressed to the point that uh, they're doing studies to evaluate whether you can just radiate the axilla and not even have to do uh, uh, sentinel node biopsies. So we see the progression and the, the precision medication and the immunotherapy that Dr. Benoit talked about is gonna make even further advances. So uh, the, the, the future looks bright and, uh, and surgery uh, may be on the decline. 
uh, in terms of uh, the aggressiveness. Uh, for example, uh, we, we're doing more nipple sparing uh, mastectomies, we're doing more uh, skin sparing mastectomies, and all of these in the studies show that they're comparable. Uh, uh, and these are for people who just may have uh, multicentric disease and uh, and it's, it's, it's been proven that the overall survival is comparable. And we're getting to the point where um, we're measuring uh, the extension of lives in months. And, you know, that, that initially I was like, well, that, that's not a whole lot of time. But when you think about maybe a parent who gets three more months and gets to see uh, a child or a grandchild born or, or a child married, then that's a significant life marker. So uh, we are making progress. Um, and I think, I think that, uh, as Dr. Benoit said, the moonshot is within our reach. Uh, I'm, hoping, uh, I'm hoping within our lifetime. Absolutely. Thank you for that answer. So yesterday, Dr. D um, Lundy made the comment that Cancer, once upon a time, was a life sentence once you were told that you were di once the diagnosis of cancer was made. But over the years, there's been a change, and it's now entering into the realm of a chronic disorder. Mm. And that's because there are a number of new modalities of diagnosis, new ways of finding out what's going on, new ways of monitoring what's going on, and new approaches with respect to treatment. Dr. Lundy, in today's complex landscape, there are multiple modalities of treatment for prostate cancer. Of course, it's of interest of my very first and second and several other speakers um, and myself. And I'm sure it's the same for most men and their wives, this issue of prostate cancer. And we have to choose what's the best way to treat with the least associated complications. From your perspective, when you navigate the minefields, what do you see as the best option for prostate, the treatment of prostate cancer? Dr. Jeff, that's a trick question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> because the best option for any for, for the best treatment option for any condition, it also it always depend on stage of diagnosis, um, which means that if you have a localized uh, cancer, meaning the cancer is at one little spot in the prostate, it, the treatment is different from if the cancer has spread to other areas, including distant places. Right, so that's the first thing. Um, and then we also look at how aggressive is this cancer. And um, so we move from probably some form of minimal surgery at the beginning, and that's I'm treading into the fields of the urologist, to where, like a case that I wanted to present, where they may be patients may be given what we call neoadjuvant therapy, which is giving hormone and chemotherapy before surgery to shrink the size of the tumor, especially if it is localized in and around the prostate, and then go on to have surgery. Surgery is almost always, I believe, an option. It, it has to be done in prostate cancer, um, almost always, but of course, we have that kind of stage in which we say, okay, the role of various forms of radiation therapy, whether it's beaming the whole pelvis or whether it's planting of different seeds. And that, so, so that also depends on the physician's comfort and the physician's preference along with discussion with the patient. There are some which you know that, for example, if a patient has prostate cancer that has spread all over the body, we know what the modality of treatment is. It's usually hormone treatment for the rest of their life, or, you know, along with other supportive therapies. But that stage where it is, let's call it 
they go into remission, I don't use the C-U-R-E word, when they go into remission, then surgery plus or minus radiation or radiation plus or minus surgery is going to be very important. Thank you. My last question before, um, and this question is to any member of the panel who, who, wish, who may wish to answer. It has been opined that anecdotally the Cayman Islands has a high incidence of cancers relative to the other regional territories. Now, we know this is anecdotal. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, how do you um, see the Cayman Islands comparing with the other um, regional territories with respect to the incidence of cancers? Any member of the panel could answer. Well, I'll jump in there. <laughs> um, I think that uh, to, to answer you, we don't have the numbers locally, and I think that is a, uh, a, a significant problem. Um, usually when I do a talk, I have to resort to utilizing U.S. Uh, numbers and demographics. Uh, and while that's relative, uh, it would be better to have the specifics of what occurs locally. Uh, because that's going to impact your whole healthcare system in terms of how you, you manage, you treat, uh, and it, it will eventually impact lives. For example, if you have a, a, a patient that is developing a particular type of cancer, uh, what are the things that uh, we can educate the public about? Uh, we, I don't think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think if any, anybody in this room has the exact number of colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, melanoma that occurs in this island. And, and until we get that, we're not really being serious about, about cancer. Dr. Jeff. Thank Dr. Jeff, I just want to add, I, I echo what you're saying, Dali, and I agree totally with you, the whole aspect of having data. And um, the current method of capturing data is voluntary. People volunteer to say, to, you know, to, 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 register, to, to register their diagnosis with the cancer registry. But that is not enough, because we see a number of patients all the time who say, nope, I don't want my information to be there. And in fact, this information is actually anonymous, right? It's totally anonymous. And, and we do, we, you know, the cancer registry doesn't know whether it's John or Jane or Mary. It does, they don't really know. And so um, it, I think it's now time to turn to the legal luminaries to ensure that a cancer registry, that, that we have obligatory registration once a cancer is diagnosed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now the floor is open. The panelists are at your disposal. If there are any pressing questions that you may have, especially around the newer modalities of treatment, now is the time to ask your questions, direct your questions to the, um, to the panel. I don't know if there is a mic that is a floating, ah, fantastic. So there's a floating mic. Um, any questions you have of the panel? Hello, good morning. Um, thank you for a really good presentation. Um, I'm piggybacking on your question, Dr. Jefferson. Anybody can answer. It's relating to prostate cancer. So Dr. Lundy did a very good answer in terms of choosing surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, but hormonal therapy. But are there any newer modalities like when Dr. Benoit was mentioning about, you know, the immune therapy targeted, is there anything like that happening for prostate either now or in the pipelines? Yes, there are certain um, targeted therapies uh, uh, that that are now being used or are in um, are in in experiment, so to speak, in research. And so we expect that to, to improve. And not only that, the type of chemotherapy that is used, that too is, is changing over time. And of course, we know every day there's a different type of androgen therapy, different type of hormone therapy coming out. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. Well, it wasn't a question. I just had a comment. Sorry. To to piggyback onto what Dr. Richards and Dr. Solomon were saying about the cancer incidents and here in Cayman, I think it's also important to note that Cayman has a very different makeup than a lot of the other Caribbean islands. And so our, we, we can't just use compare, compare to the other islands in order to determine what our incidence and data is. So I think it's very important to why we need to develop our own um, registry here. Absolutely, yes, thank you. Right, I see. Um there was a question somewhere, no? All right, are there any other questions for the panel, yeah? Um, Ms. Flynn? I just wondered whether there, these new modalities, treatment strategies are applicable in pancreatic cancers. I haven't heard anything. I know our focus today is more about lung and breast, but I wondered about pancreatic, whether pancreatic there was cancer. any newer treatment research in that area. Right. Uh, that's one of the uh, strongest um, areas of research. Uh, we've gotten to the point now where somebody with a 3B uh, pancreatic cancer uh, can be downgraded to resectability. In other words, I don't know how familiar you guys are, but Basically, up to a couple of years ago, anybody who was diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer, we, we just kind of said, okay, you've got a six-month survival. And now we can get out to 30, 38 months. Uh, so if we can downgrade them with these new modalities, these precision therapies, the immunotherapy, we can uh, make it so that the surgery is an option uh, more so than it used to be. So we, the tremendous strides. And uh, in terms of systemic therapy, we have uh, the BRCA mutation that I was talking about for breast cancer is also, you know, found in pancreatic cancer. So if you have the BRCA mutation, then PARP inhibitors, which I mentioned, could be an option. And just to state how liquid biopsies could help, so in advanced pancreatic cancer just last month, we did the liquid biopsy, we found a BRAF mutation. So the BRF mutation is found in colorectal cancers more commonly, not so much in pancreatic cancer, but and melanomas. But we could use a drug that targets BRF, which we use is approved for melanoma for this patient if he fails chemotherapy or progresses. So things are looking up even for the most aggressive cancers. And she mentioned uh, melanoma. Some of some of the uh, the patients with advanced melanoma now get to a point where they have complete remission. Uh, so there's no evidence of, of melanoma that you can see with some of these therapies. Right. right. Um, so, sorry, Dr. Jeff. One of the topics that we, um, that we were supposed to discuss a little bit, and I know Venita went over some of them and I did yesterday, was, is also the whole aspect of colorectal cancer. Now, you know, the colon, I don't know how long it is, how many miles? <laughs> right. And um, cancer can occur at any part of the colon. But as you move from right down to left, down to the anus, the treatment modality may change somewhat. And, um, you know, we have the usual colon cancer, rectal cancer, anal cancer. And as we move along, as I say, even the targeted therapy for that specific part of the colon may change along the line. We would have heard um, recently from the last ASCO conference that there, there is no a experimental drug that persons who presented with advanced mean metastatic colon cancer, uh, rectal cancer, uh, that the, the disease in all of them, 100% went into remission, complete remission. Right, but this was over a six month period. There's still a, a, a further to go in terms of these studies, but really, really piggy, piggybacking that, you know, with, with research, it appears that what you mentioned earlier on, that uh, cancer is not necessarily a death sentence, and, you know, there, 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 there is hope on the horizon for long term survival. Right. Unfortunately, we have time for just one more question. Um, okay. 
I've, 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 I've noticed. Cool. Okay, I am going to say time enough for two questions. All right, go ahead and ask your question, and then Dr. Williams. Can Hi, yes, um, I'll, I'll just make this quick. So um, uh, yesterday, uh, Mr. Smelly had done his presentation and he had told us, which is very, very encouraging, that we'll be doing um, testing in, in the early stages for in the next coming six to eight months. Um, that being said, and, and with the cancers that you've discussed um, in today and throughout the last three days, um, with respect to Cayman, and I do know that DART and um, the Ministry of Health and Health Services uh, are all committed to um, building that new infrastructure over by Kamana Bay. Um, what, with the cancers you've discussed, many, um, I'm not local, as you can tell, I'm white on rice, but um, with many local people, they have to endure the expense of going off island for treatments and things like that. What cancers are currently available to be treated on island? And in addition to these future infrastructures, could we actually have a cancer facility on island so that that would also help alleviate a lot of the um, payments and struggles for, for people having to go overseas for treatment? Good question. Most cancers, and I, I use the word, most cancers are treatable on island. And I, I use the word most cancers. The ones that we think about every day, the colon, the rectum, the anal, the pancreatic, all of those, we have all the systemic treatments available. Even if for today this person has a rare cancer and says, oh, we have never treated this before, but fortunately, within weeks we have access to the, to the various um, drugs. What we don't have access to at this moment is radiation therapy, which for, for whatever cancer that needs radiation, and that's where the, the new complex with its new linear accelerator um, will likely provide that kind of service. There are others that we do not, we, that other therapies that we're not offering yet, but probably in the future things like CAR T, CAR -T therapy, um, but with our with progress, I'm pretty certain that will happen. So it's mainly radiation therapy, if I think of anything else, that obviously it's a, it, it, you have to move to the, to the facility to have it done. You know. But now we're bringing the facility closer. And if we can add on to that, pediatric cancers. We don't treat pediatric cancers. That is an entirely different specialty in itself. Right. So um, at the moment, we don't have a pediatric oncologist, but uh, hopefully right. we'll reach there eventually. And there's a tendency for us not to treat acute leukemia because, again, it requires a kind of a very, very aggressive um, backup support, which we don't, we're not, we don't really have enough of that on island. Right. Thank you very much. Um, if, I, if, if I just want to, uh, if I could just say one thing. So what, what this has highlighted is the fact that we're moving towards... An, uh, a, a time when we will hopefully soon be able to manage all of our cancers here on island. And we've come a long way over the past several years, and we're almost there. We're just this close. Um, however, there are still some cancers that unfortunately we have to send off. And, um, but soon and very soon, with the collaboration that's happening, you'll probably be able to have less people going off. The last question is from an anesthetist, Dr. Williams. Uh, let me thank the panel for exciting news about the treatment of cancer. Um, I have a question pertaining to the, the whole focus of the conference, which is your health promotion, prevention, and positive intervention, where cancer is concerned. I'm hoping here that we have a room full of healthy people who are cancer-free. How do we from here, go about preventing cancer? And what, what research, what, what work is out there to, to promote that? I can start off with that one in terms of, and, and I want to link it to the very first presentation on Friday. Yes, absolutely. Thursday yes. night. Thursday um, night. Thursday night. Thursday, no, Thursday night, as well as Dr. Ravi's presentation 
yesterday morning. And it's about um, healthy lifestyle. There are certain things that we can do um, in terms of, you know, like I plan to stop smoking tomorrow morning, all right? Um, the amount of alcohol I take, the, you know, the, the types of, of food that I, that, that I consume. And I'm not saying that direct, any direct one food or the other may be direct causes of cancer. But healthy lifestyle, exercise, diet, all of these are implicated, not only in cancer, but also how do we maintain our blood pressure stable, how do we maintain our diabetes um, at an acceptable level. So all of these I think are things that we can, that, that are preventive. The, the other aspect of, of, of it is what are we doing or what should we do in terms of early diagnosis, right? That is very, very important. And we have a number of um, radiological studies that can be done. We have scopes that can be done. But we also have, we can do stool sampling to, to look for bleeding, in the, bleeding from the bowel. This may be an, an early hint that somebody is having some kind of colorectal cancer, for example. So these things are important. I know that my friend, Dr. Martinez, will tell, every time she'll say, oh, well, this person has been smoking for a number of years. This person has, um, is at this age. So we probably should do a CT to see what is happening there in the chest, right? So there are certain things that, that can be done. The other aspect is, if we are fortunate or unfortunate to know that there are some kind of genomic familial thing going on, then it's important along that line that there be closer scrutiny. So instead of starting to, to do your scopes in the, in the high 40s, then we might want to bring it down to about 40 years old or even earlier, depending on what the family history is like. And the same in terms of people with family history of prostate cancer and so on along the line. And beyond all this, if I may okay. add, uh, what our, uh, Dr. Richard said, if you want to have any specific intervention to target the population, then we should know the demographics of cancer. So we come back to the need for a hospital-based registry and for more data, and I think that's where we should be, you know, going first. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to the audience for being so engaging. Just join me in giving a big thank you to the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jefferson and the panel. Uh, that was a very important discussion as we come to a climax of this 13th Annual Healthcare Conference. But before we wrap up, I invite the Honorable Sabrina Turner, Minister for Health and Wellness, to deliver closing remarks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I'm not even going to ask for a rowdier afternoon because I guess you're feeling almost like me, acknowledging that the 13th annual Cayman Islands Health Conference has come to its close. So I totally feel it. I trust that it has been an informative few days for everyone who has participated, whether as a speaker, as an attendee. And I can confirm, and for those of you who stuck with us, I'm happy to say that I sat for all of the sessions. And from all accounts and all the engagements that I have had, they were very insightful, people share the same sentiments, and definitely very thought-provoking. Now, as a former member of the nursing profession, the Ministry and the Ministry for Health now, I am concerned about the prevalence of non-communicable diseases in our community and the impact it has had on the quality of life for our people and the strain that it has placed on our healthcare systems. However, I am excited about the future of health and public health. And in the Cayman Islands, 
that is something we all should be proud of. Being excited and looking forward of what's to come. And I believe that the presentations that were shared here with us over the past three days can be used to inform the initiatives that are already in the works in the ministry as we shift our focus to public health and putting the spotlight on non-communicable diseases. As we leave here today, I am committed more than ever to ensuring an equitable, sustainable, and successful healthcare system. For all, this is one of the 10 um, strategic broad outcomes that the PACT government has developed as part of our 2022 to 2024 strategic policy statement. There is no reason, there is absolutely no reason why the Cayman Islands cannot be a center of excellence for the region and even further afield. However, we must all play our part and make that a reality. And I expect each and every one of us to play and take on that role. We must prioritize the education, employment, and retention of our Caymanian healthcare professionals. And for those Caymanians working overseas, we must provide incentives for them to come home and work in our hospitals, clinics, schools, and also be able to share the benefits of their experiences. Furthermore, succession plans must be put in place and clear pathways for career advancements established to which future generations of Caymanian doctors and healthcare professionals can aspire. Looking forward, I plan to redirect funding so that more monies are invested in care, prevention, diagnosis, mitigation, cure, treatment, and as opposed to non-clinical investments, we're definitely gonna get the balance right. We need to get back on track and make preventative care and public health our national priority. Now, equitable access to quality health care is a basic human right. We need to stop talking about funding health care and have more discourse about fixing our health systems. I need to repeat that. We need to stop talking and we got to start fixing our health care systems. I plan to start those conversations and I'm so grateful that our community has been blessed to have the resources such as conferences just like this and the expertise of a diverse medical society that are ready and willing to engage in those discussions. Let me take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, our exhibitors for their support, and once again, helping us to make this conference a huge success. I would also like to take the opportunity to recognize our local and international speakers for so graciously giving up their time to educate us, each of their own unique perspectives. Mr. Ben Mead, thank you again for being our master of ceremony two consecutive years. We appreciate your, your commitment. The management and staff here of the Ritz-Carlton, again, only the Ritz-Carlton can do it just like this. And the GIS staff, Radio Cayman, have seen you. Thank you for being our vessels, our vehicle for getting and sharing our message. Now, if you've missed out on any of these sessions, I would like to, we, we, or you would like to hear them again, they will be available for viewing on CIG TV, YouTube, YouTube channel late next week. I encourage you to share what you have learned here over the last three days with your friends, your families, neighbors, and definitely coworkers. The Ministry of Health is already looking ahead to next year's event. 
and I encourage you all to share your feedback and ideas in the survey that will be uh, sent out next week. This will assist us in shaping the theme and format, including other suggestions for next year's event. I looking, I'm looking forward to seeing you and hearing from you again in 2023, God's willing. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you very much, Minister Turner. I don't think I could end on a higher note than that. So I will thank you all for coming and wish you a pleasant weekend. Thank you very much.